radiation thrust spirally outward to unwind dense solids into space to surround solids. Each is an equal reaction to the other. Each becomes the other sequentially. Gravitation is the positive electric principle which exerts its pressures centripetally toward the maximum incandescent points of compression in every wave field. It is the father principle of nature, the integrating principle of uphill flow of energy, which forever balances its downhill flow. Radiation is the negative electric principle, which exerts its pressures centrifugally towards its wave field boundary planes of magnetic light. It is the mother principle of nature, the disintegrating principle of downhill flow of energy, which forever balances its uphill flow. The Creator extends its power of motion to but one half of a cycle for each of the two opposite manifestations of His desire. Gravity gives a material form to bodies to manifest the idea of bodies. Radioactivity gives spiritual formlessness to the heavens for re-giving to earths as formed bodies. Gravity begins its half cycle as the inward explosive reaction of an outward explosive action, thus fulfilling the law that all opposite expressions are born from each other and interchange to become the other. It ends its half cycle at a point of rest at the still point of magnetic light which centers every material body, whether of microcosmic or macrocosmic dimension. Gravity then ceases when its motion ceases. There is no center of gravity in nature. The centering light of every mass is still magnetic light. Likewise, the still axis of every vortex is still magnetic light. Radiativity then begins its half cycle from that point of rest and ends it on wave field boundary planes of magnetic light where gravity began. Radiativity then ceases when its motion ceases. Both gravity and radiativity borrow their power to find balance in rest as their journeys end from the points of rest of their beginnings. They each repay their separate borrowings to the other at every point of their respective journeys. Each thus perpetually voids itself by giving to the other. At each journey's end, each opposite cancels itself out by giving its all to the other. It is then reborn as the other. Everywhere in nature, each action is its own reaction. Death gives to life that life may live, and life gives to death that death may die from the Divine Iliad. That noise you're hearing is goof behind me. <laughs> I think you guys can see her anyway. <laughs> Every action in nature demonstrates this principle. A ball thrown in the air must start from a point of rest. Motivated by energy borrowed from the center of gravity of this earth which is its fulcrum. The point of rest in the thrower's hand is an extension of the earth's still center. As the ball ascends, it decelerates as it pays its borrowed energy to space, thus charging space with the borrowings of earth and equally discharging earth. When the borrowing is fully paid, the ball comes to rest. From that point, it must again borrow the energy from space, which it borrowed from earth to pay for its return to earth. Upon its accelerative journey to earth, it passes each point at the same speed it registered on the upward half cycle thus discharging space and equally charging earth to balance all borrowings and payings. All actions in nature are extension retractions from zero to zero and back again to zero. All are balanced simultaneously and sequentially. This is a zero universe of plus and minus zero which never exceeds the zero of the one light from which it seemingly sprang as multiplicity. The two opposite electric conditions. This zero universe of equilibrium demands two opposed conditions in order to simulate that which our senses interpret for motion and change. These two needed conditions are plus and minus equilibrium, positive and negative electricity. Plus zero means a credit of pressure borrowed from the universal equilibrium to compress a large volume into a small volume. Minus zero means an equal expansion to balance the borrowed compression. A thousand dollars borrowed from a bank is a plus condition of credit. 
which is balanced by an equal debit of $1,000. The central zero represents the bank. The extended zeros represent credit and debit. Both are equal but opposite. A credit of $1,000 equals zero. When the credit is paid in part or in full, the debit is proportionally voided simultaneously with the credit. These two opposite conditions of credit and debit correspond with the two opposite conditions of compression and expansion in nature, upon which motion is dependent. When an equilibrium pressure is divided into opposite conditions from the zero, from which both are extended, motion between the two becomes imperative. They must interchange with each other to void their unbalanced conditions. This is the principle of the electric current. Figure 18 represents a room of equal pressure. Two tanks in it are connected with a tube and petcock. By pumping all the air out of one tank into the other, the two plus minus conditions have been established which make motion imperative. Nature always borns each opposite from the other in this manner. By opening the petcock, an outward explosion will take place in the plus tank. An inward explosion of equal potential will take place in the evacuated tank. The plus tank will discharge part of its compressed condition to charge the minus one. The electric battery is the same in principle. In nature, the discharged radiation which explodes outward from the sun simultaneously explodes inward as gravitation. Cause of the universal pulse beat. Matter and space constitute the two conditions necessary for interchange of motion diagrammed in figures 18 and 19 with one distinguishing difference. That difference is that the two conditions represented by the tanks of the compressed and expanded air and the two cells of the electric battery are equal in volume, while bodies of matter and their surrounding space are unequal in volume. The expanded condition of space is millions of times greater in volume than the compressed condition of its centering body. This explains the seeming mystery of gravitation and radiation which causes solid objects to fall toward the earth and gases to rise toward space. In the electric battery, the interchange between the two pressure conditions can void both in an explosive flash by a short circuit if the wire connecting both cells is heavy enough. If a small wire connects both cells, the interchange takes time to complete the voidance. Each condition gives to the other in installments, for the wire is not big enough to void both conditions instantly. The consequent giving and re-giving by the two opposite pressures constitute the oscillations of the electric current. Electric interchange by installments is measured and recorded by waves and the time element of those recordings of interchange are wave frequencies. They constitute the pulse beat of the electric current. When an electric wire pulses with wave frequencies of an electric current, we say that it is a live wire. When it stops pulsing because the current is disconnected, we say that the wire is dead, for it no longer pulses. All nature pulses in measured frequencies with the heartbeat of the universal electric current as evidenced by universal breathing inward toward bodies and outward toward space. When breathing is switched off in man's body by the cessation of interchange between the two opposite pressure conditions of matter, we say that the man is dead. By solving the mystery of installment interchange between bodies and space, one can more fully comprehend the fact that neither pulse beat, breathings, nor wave frequencies of interchange have any relation whatsoever to life for they relate only to the principle by means of which life or energy is manifested by motion. The first step in solving this mystery lies in the principle by means of which matter and space become unequal in volume. Figure 20 represents the electric battery with the line AB dividing the two pressure conditions as the equilibrium of both. This line represents a static equator a plane of rest from which both opposite conditions are extended at right angles as a dynamic equator, line CD. Figure 21 represents static and dynamic equators, or magnetic and electric, at 90 degrees from each other. As the two opposed conditions which extend from these planes of rest are equal, 
the lines of force which connect both are as symmetrical to both diameters as though reflected by mirrors placed at right angles to each other. Such symmetry belongs to the cube and sphere alone. Figure 22 represents the electric battery with a negative cell much larger than the positive cell. The static and dynamic equators will still be at right angles to each other, but the static equator will not be in the middle. It will be much nearer the positive pole and will be curved because lines of force which record the measure of interchange between the two opposite pressures can be symmetrical to the dynamic equator only and not to the static equator. Such symmetry belongs to the radial universe of cone sections. All dynamic equators are radial and all lines of force of conic symmetry are forever changing to record the forever changing potential of dynamic equators. Figure 23 illustrates this principle which forms spheres and creates the illusion which makes heavy objects seem to be attracted radially toward the earth and tenuous matter thrust radially away from it. Line AB shows the curvature of the static equator which causes the dynamic equator to expand at its negative end and contract at its positive end into the radii of a cone. The outward thrust of radiative pressures would curve the base of the cone thus produced to correspond with the curvature of its static equator, AB. Figure 24 represents a bar magnet which has been divided into the two opposite pressure conditions of this electric universe by coiling a charged wire around the bar of steel, thus forming two opposed plus and minus electrical vortices with intensities measured at poles. Two nails of equal weight are suspended to these poles. It is not magnetism, however, which picks up these nails. It is the electric vortices which pick them up, for the vortices are still effective upon that steel bar even though the electric charged wire has been removed. It is the whirlpool motion of the electric vortex which performs the work of lifting those nails and not the stillness of the poles of magnetic light. If the bar magnet is enlarged at one end, it becomes a cone. The division into the two opposed conditions will still be equal, as in figure 25, but the volume will be so large in one as compared with the other that the nail which the positive end will still pick up cannot be lifted by the negative end unless the nail is ground to a fine powder. The negative end will then lift the same weight in total, but only by dividing the nail over the whole volume. Before this principle is applied to matter and space, it is necessary to correct the general impression that the Earth is a magnet. By referring to the bar magnet pictured in figure 24, it can be seen that its poles alone express gravity. The Earth, on the contrary, expresses gravity at its center. The Earth is formed between magnetic gaps of its wave as all bodies are formed. If two bar magnets are placed so that negative and positive ends are near each other, that still point, which we call the center of gravity, will evidence itself between the two ends. If iron filings are placed in this gap, conditions of gravity similar to those of the Earth will be found there. Gravity will end and radiation will begin at that center. Nails will fall toward it from any direction, as heavy objects do on Earth and compass needles will follow the vortical directions of lines of force which extend toward its pole. The analogy between the unequal battery cells and bar magnets is now sufficiently complete to compare them with matter and space. In figure 28, two bar magnets have been fanned out into cones. The weight which the positive end will pick up as a solid has to be finely divided in order for the expanded volume of the negative end to pick it up. The essential difference between the two opposed pressure conditions of the electric battery and the two of matter and space is that in the battery the opposed potentials are equal because the volumes are equal. In the universal battery of matter and space, the two opposed conditions are conspicuously unequal. The resultant high and low potential contrast each other so violently that the solid matter falling toward the high potential of the compressed condition must be divided into vapors and gases before the same substance will fall toward the low potential of the expanded condition. 
A solid bar of iron will fall radially toward the earth because both are high potential compressed solids. If divided sufficiently by vaporizing it, that same bar of iron will fall radially toward the heavens. Gravity and radiativity are opposite pressure conditions of the same thing. Both of those pressure conditions are in every creating thing. Every creating thing can expand to lower its potential or can contract to raise it. Like conditions seek like conditions to find balance. Creating things changing their compressed conditions to expanded conditions must move to find balance in like conditions. That is the sole cause of two-way motion. Every potential has a balancing potential position somewhere in the universe. Desire to find that position is in every creating thing and any restraint exerted to prevent it from moving to find its balancing potential can be measured as weight. The cause of the radial universe which constitutes matter and space lies in the inequality of its two opposite pressure conditions both as to volume and potential. The cause of the universal pulse speed and the breathing which motivates the manifestation of life in every creating thing lies also in its inequality. All creating things pulse and breathe just as organic life pulses and breathes, but that is not life, it is but motion. The universe is dual, the still magnetic universe of reality and the dynamic electric radial two-way universe of illusion which extends from the static universe at any angle of 90 degrees. In the dynamic electric universe there are two directions inward and outward radially from a still point of magnetic light to still planes of magnetic light. All motion within magnetic wave fields is controlled by the Creator. For behold, I am within all things, centering them, and I am without all things, controlling them. From the Divine Iliad. The inward radial direction is north. The compressive direction of gravity which multiplies potential by compressing light waves radially into smaller volumes of greater frequencies. The outward radial direction is south. The expansive direction of radiation which divides potential by expanding light waves into larger volumes of lesser frequencies. The two directions of the static universe are east and west. They are static because they are spherical. They follow curved planes of unchanging equipotential pressures such as the contour of the earth or sun or of the orbits of planets or floating clouds. East and west do not oppose each other. Each arrives at its own starting point without change of potential. North and south on the contrary diametrically oppose each other. They are constantly changing. They seek opposite directions, each passing through the other in opposite spiral lanes, each interchanging with the other as it passes, each voiding the other through that interchange, and each becoming the other because of it. East-West spherical planes form the axes of light waves from which the dynamic universe extends its gyroscopic wave radially at amplitudes of 90 degrees and also its other gyroscopic octave tones at the varying degrees of pressures where the elements of matter are formed. East-West spherical planes are also the fulcrums of wave levers which curve gravity as they pump high potential into low to expand solids into the gases of space and low potential into high to compress light waves into the solids of Earth's. Incandescent suns of white hot light are born from cold black darkness and cold dark space is born from white hot suns. This curved electric universe. All suns are generated into incandescence by two black rivers of evacuated light which flow centripetally inward toward their still centers by the way of their poles. Conversely, darkness of space is radiated from two incandescent rivers of white light which flow centrifugally from sun's equators. Thus are the four arms of all spiral nebulae formed as two pairs of opposite interchanging with each other to become the other two. The two black arms belong to gravity and the two white ones to vacuity. This electric universe is curved. Motion is spiral. Where motion ceases, curvature ceases. 
Cleavages between wavefield boundary planes of crystals separate them into their individual crystal forms. Motion cannot pass through those planes, for there is naught but stillness there. Motion is repeated in all wave fields by reflected extension from wave field boundary planes. Curvature is imperative under such conditions, for opposed pressures resist each other, and each must bend to the other to find passage for its own expression of force. Motion and curvature simultaneously begin and end when opposition begins and ends. Each wave field is like a separate projection machine in which its own curved motion picture universe is duly projected upon its self-measured zero screen of space, A in figure 39. The incandescent sphere of light which centers its pictures the forms of desire in the measure of desire for manifestation. See also figure 38. Okay, we may just stop there. Oh my goodness, let's see. Am I almost to the end? See also figure 38. Okay, we may just stop there. Oh my goodness, let's see. People think our particles are spherical wave structures consisting of an outgoing wave combined with a, an in wave. Mathematicians are fairly happy with this because these are the only two possible solutions of the equations. So that part is okay. Now the center of this structure behaves just like a particle. The only problem is not many people know it yet because not many people have investigated it. Oh my goodness, let's see. Am I almost to the end? Hello and welcome to what I think is going to be the final segment of The Secret of Light by Walter Russell. We're in section three and here we go. This curved universe consists of lenses and mirrors of light which reflect, bend, curve, concentrate and decentrate light into its countless forms. Any action anywhere is repeated everywhere by and through countless mirror planes of wave fields and the lenses of space, figures 40 and 41. Concentrated spheres such as the Earth and Sun are surrounded by layers of light of equal pressures. Clouds float around the Earth in them. The reason they float in curves parallel to the Earth is because of these spherical equipotential planes of pressures which curve as the Earth curves. Curved pressures of light act as lenses to multiply and divide light radially. Light rays which pass through curved planes concentrate toward a point when projected through light lenses of space in the convex direction and decentrate when they pass through in the concave direction, figures 42 and 43. Gravity and radiativity are accounted for by this fact. Every object which falls toward the earth falls radially towards its center because of this fact. No two men who stand upright in balance with gravity stand parallel to each other. Lines drawn through the feet and head of any two men standing in either hemisphere would form a cone with its base in the heavens and its apex at earth's center. Rain falling vertically from a cloud falls conically. The area of the base of the cone in the cloud is greater than its conical measurement on the earth, figures 44 and 45. The electric potential of rain increases as it falls because of multiplication of pressures by the lenses of light which surround the earth. For the same reason, a man weighs less as he ascends a mountain and regains it when descending. And here we are on the next page and obviously there's something missing because 
we're picking up in the middle of a sentence and the last page ended a sentence. So, I don't know. You guys help me out if you know what it is. Leave a comment. But here we go. Picking up in the middle of a sentence with figure 50 as the first figure. Are born with centripetal and centrifugal spirals meet. Matter registers the potential of the position of its birth. For that reason, it floats in equipotential orbits appropriate to its position in its wave field, together with all units of its system. In the electric current, electronic systems are born where the familiar loops of force occur around a charged wire, figure 50. Figures 51, 52, and 53 diagram electric systems forming at AA. The spiral is an incomplete sphere, just as crystal forms are incomplete cubes. Spirals and crystals have individuality which they lose by voidance in the oneness of spheres and cubes. Individuality is given bodies for the purpose of manifesting separateness and multiplicity. Individuality, separateness, and multiplicity are then voided in oneness. Individuality in every creating thing is a moment-to-moment -moment record of its unfoldment and refoldment. It is the fruit of cosmic desire for creative expression. It begins when the cycle begins, ends with its ending, and repeats itself in each cycle until the entire cycle of any expressed idea is voided in its completion. Two-way sex-conditioned spirals are the consummate individuals of all creation. They condition all bodies with the condition of their bodies. They unfold all idea from stillness of mind knowing into moving form of mind imagining and refold it into the stillness of mind knowing. They are the electric workers which fulfill desire of mind by interweaving threads of light into patterned forms and recording those patterned forms in the still light which centers every spiral pair as the axis of a cone centers the cone. The one centering axis of both spirals is the shaft upon which the dynamic universe rotates. All motion rotates and revolves upon still centering shafts, and all shafts are two-way extensions of points which lead to and through centers of spheres. The familiar wave line which records all effects of motion controls those effects. One can record that wave line but is not aware of the fact that it is the power extended by the Creator in the measure of desire for power. The wave line is a record of the amount of energy borrowed from its static equator to express any mechanical process such as the vibration of a harp string. The pulsations of an engine, the cardiogram of one's heartbeat, or the pattern of an earthquake, as recorded by a seismograph. Figures 54, 55, 56, 57, and 58. The shaft of a wave is a line drawn through every point upon the surface of a wave disturbed ocean in a vertical section, where water and sky meet. Around the still shaft of the wave, all motion of the wave spirals to interweave the patterns and forms of desire. All spiral forms must have intense individuality in order to express such amazing varieties of form and pattern. Figure 59. The inside-out, outside-in turnings of all creating forms is due to the gradual unfolding, refolding principle of nature. This process is controlled by spiral pairs which are motivated by still centering shafts of magnetic light. Opposed pairs of spirals gradually expand centrifugally to planes meeting at static equators to complete the unfolding half of a cycle. They then contract as the opposite of what they were to complete the other half. During the entire journey, they continue without reversal of direction. A clockwise spiral is always a clockwise spiral during its entire centripetal journey to its apex and its centrifugal journey to its base. The opposed pair which rotate upon the same shaft are anti-clockwise, for both are projected through each other. Figure 60. The characteristic unfolding, refolding, inside-out, outside-in principle of nature causes the integration of matter at poles and disintegration at equators. 
Matter integrates by the contraction of one pair of spirals around the shafts which wind it into spheres by the way of their poles and disintegrates it by the expansion of the other pair which unwind it by way of equators. The pair of spirals which wind light waves into spheres continue that winding until holes are bored through spheres and rings are formed aided by the centrifugal force exerted by the expansion of the opposing spirals. Rings are the death half of the cycles of spheres. Rings recondense around points in space and rewind as spheres. The majestic ring nebula in Lyra, figure 61, is an outstanding example of the disintegration process of nature. The ring exemplifies the death half of the cycle and the newly formed sun, at its center the life half. A new body has been born out of the old one as it expanded into the heavens. The heavens abound with new bodies appearing from old ones which have disappeared into another form. The Owl Nebula demonstrates this principle by two rings and two stars reborn from them. Figure 62. The rings of Saturn will become moons just as its other rings have become its several other moons. Our own moon was born from a ring from Earth as it expands its bulk by absorbing its oceans and accelerates its rotation as all the outer planets have done. Figure 63. Jupiter is even now developing belts which will be thrown off as rings to become moons. These moons will become comets and eventually plunge into the sun as all things in this solar system likewise do. Figure 64 illustrates the unwinding process by means of which moons free themselves from the bindings of their mother shaft to again seek revolution around the shaft of their beginning in the sun. Disintegration of suns and planets by radiation is accompanied by flattening at their poles. Spheres come into being by prolating and go out by oblating. Ever increasing speed of rotation around shafts is the cause of this phenomenon. Inner planets rotate very slowly upon their own shafts because they are so close to their mother shaft in the Sun, but they revolve very swiftly in their orbits around the Sun. Figure 65. Mercury, our own moon, and Phobos, the inner moon of Mars, are so close to their mother shaft that they are obliged to revolve swiftly, with the same face always toward their primary. The outer planets have so far broken away from the influence of their mother shaft in the sun that their years have materially lengthened, their days conspicuously shortened, and their faces are constantly changing in relation to the sun. Cyclones, water spouts, and tornadoes develop on our earth when spirals tighten around their shafts. For the more they thus contract, the greater their speed. When spirals are so wide at their bases that the angles to the Earth's surface are negligible, there is calmness and peace. Stillness at 90 degrees to the Earth's surface they then do inestimable damage. Figure 66. The Universal Octave. The heartbeat of the universe, starting from zero of rest, spirals from its minimum to its maximum and back again to zero, in four pairs of opposite actions and reactions. These four pairs of opposite electric interweavers constitute the universal spiral octave wave by means of which the dynamic universe of effect rises from the static universe of cause. Figure 67. The octave wave formula which governs all motion and its birth position in the universal wave is as follows in Figure 68. Figure 68 is the two-way journey from zero through zero to zero. 0 to 4 means the centripetal direction toward the apex of the spiral, which leads to higher potential, density, gravity, and the white heat of incandescence. 4 to 0 means the centrifugal direction toward the base of the spiral, which leads to lower pressure, lower potential, vacuity, radiativity, and the black cold of space. Each of these is half of a cycle. The reason an octave cannot be counted from 1 to 8 instead of from 1 to 4 is because each of the pressures which bear the relations of 1 to 4 positive in the octave is a credit pressure which has its equal opposite debit pressure in 1 to 4 Once. negative. I'm going to call this P. Okay? 
So what I'm counting is crest, 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 crest. One, two, three, four. So what I can say then is that the distance between S1 and P, okay, so you know from math class, if you put a line over top, it means line S1 to P. Well, maybe they don't teach you that, I'm not sure, but if you put a line over top, it means a line between these two points equals four wavelengths. A line from S2 to P equals, let's count, one, two, three, ah, four wavelengths. So let's write down an important note right now. Note, any point along C, the central maximum, any point along C will be an equal number of wavelengths. Why can't I? Oh, that's what I want. Equal number of wavelengths from S1 and S2. So what is the result of that? This means there will be constructive interference. along C, okay? You will always have constructive interference along C, this line here, because you always have an exact equal number of wavelengths coming. And I'm gonna draw this in just to try to help you visualize, okay? So if we have like this kind of thing going on here, and this kind of thing going on here, uh. You'll notice that both of these are on the upswing. They're both at the crest point exactly when they meet here, right? One, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. No matter where I do that, if I go to the next one, it'll be the same, but it'll be five. If I go here, it'll be four or five troughs, right? If I come to the middle, it's one, two, and a half, one, two, and a half, right at the middle. So no matter where I am, we have constructive interference coming along here, okay? And any point along here, right, if this is exactly in the middle, is equidistant from each of those. Okay? So this is an important point. 